Uh, it's a real pleasure and honor to give this talk at this uh, memorial meeting. Uh, perhaps I should say a few words about uh, Abdus Salam. I joined Imperial College as a PhD student in 1974. And uh, of course, Abdus was uh, very well known already. And just a few weeks later, there was this uh, great discovery uh, of the JSI. And uh, that's when I first encountered uh, Abdus and Paul Matthews, and I think Yogesh Pati also passed by at that point. And it was a great gusto. They were trying to explain what had been observed. And so, and great delight as well uh, in proposing models, uh, which uh, in the end uh, didn't quite turn out to be right. But I think that also set a pattern of uh, interpreting experimental work, uh, again with great delight and gusto. Uh, I also remember uh, uh, atomic parity violation experiments where uh, Abdus was trying to explain. I actually left uh, five years later and based myself in Geneva, so I didn't really overlap very much with Abdus. He used to be quite often in ICTP in Trieste. But I did actually uh, do some more work on the Patti Salam model uh, because uh, when I joined CERN as a fellow, uh, I've always found the uh, the fact that the quarks have a fractional electric charge a bit odd. So we set out to measure this uh, using the uh, QCD equivalent of the QED Compton diagram, so photons of quarks. And the two real photons actually allow you to measure the charge. And it was found to be a third, uh, fractionally charged, in other words. Uh, otherwise, the cross-section would have been much larger. So that was uh, uh, the sort of uh, one other thing which I owe my perhaps career to of this uh, in part is the fact that when I applied for a position at Imperial College, uh, Abdus was on the uh, interview panel with Paul Matthews. And uh, so I must have done OK since they hired me. And I think Kelly, who's sitting over there, was hired at the same time. Uh, we were in the same uh, promotion, as they say. So let me come to the, uh, the talk uh, today. Uh, this is uh, in two parts, as was mentioned. and. Uh, I think what we're trying to do is to give you an, a, a historical overview of things and also take you uh, to what one would expect in the near future and the medium term, if, if you like. Now, I think the, uh, I put the citation in red in the parts which uh, are uh, Atlas and CMS experiments, in a sense. It's the confirmation, which is what these experiments did. So what I wanted to do was to give a, a look back from 50 years on so this was a paper that we submitted uh, in a single volume, Atlas and CMS. And uh, if I look down the references, uh, the first uh, 10 or 15 references of this paper, they actually chart the journey uh, to this uh, uh, discovery, if you wish. And the first set of papers are obviously the mechanism papers. Uh, there are four of them. And uh, according to Tom Kibble, these papers on spontaneous symmetry breaking mechanism attracted very little attention at the time, and the boson attracted even less attention. Uh, so continuing down the list of references, there's another one by Tom Kibble, number six. And this was actually further work on the detailed application of this mechanism to non-abelian theories. And the work helped in getting to electroweak unification. And according to Peter Higgs, it provided the bridge from the 64 papers to the famous 67 paper of Weinberg. And those are the papers uh, that follow in this list. And so those are the three papers which actually set out electroweak unification, and uh, which we all know. And electroweak theory was labeled by Abdus Salam. And so that's the term that he gave. Now, both uh, Salam and Weinberg had speculated uh, that their theory was renormalizable. This was proven by Gerard and uh, Tini Weltman, and they got the Nobel Prize in 1999. And one of the key predictions of this uh, model was that uh, there should be neutral current interactions which were observed uh, at CERN. And then in 1983, the WNZ particles were discovered in, uh, at CERN, UA1, UA2, and uh, that merited a Nobel Prize to Carlo and uh, Simon van der Beer. At that point, I think uh, uh, the Higgs boson became the last essentially important missing piece, although top was still to be discovered. And so that actually set the scene for the work that had to be done. And so this is a transparency that I picked up from the early 1990s as to we, the sort of questions one was asking at the time. 
and to see if the LHC could answer them. And there's a list of about five questions. Uh, and so this is an old transparency. Uh, and uh, I've highlighted in red the parts that uh, I might say a few more words about. So clarification of the electroweak symmetry breaking sector, and we know that now is uh, done by the mechanism. I, I've left the Higgs mechanism there because it's an old transparency. In those days, we, we didn't call it the BEH mechanism yet. Uh, there's another part to that story which still has to be confirmed, which is that uh, uh, the unitarity condition is satisfied by the Higgs exchange, which is still work to be done, and it'll take about 10 years to uh, answer that question. But there's other questions which were also known at the time. Uh, the identification of the matters that, uh, particles that make up dark matter. And it was known that even if the Higgs boson was found, then one would actually be asking the question uh, about its mass being so low. This is the hierarchy problem. And so this was known at the time. And then clearly the other parts, which is uh, physics uh, uh, beyond the standard model at the TeV scale. And so these uh, dramatic concepts of supersymmetry and extra space-time dimensions that we were discussing yesterday. Now, the, uh, uh, this is a timeline of the project, and Peter Yeni is going to talk more about that, so I'll skip that. And he was, he's going to give you the history of the uh, machine itself uh, from its uh, conception. Now, the standard model Higgs boson actually did play a very important role in the design of the experiments. And this is, again, a transparency from the 1990s. And this shows the uh, decay modes and the width at the top and uh, as was mentioned yesterday, the width in the region that we found it is very narrow, it's about 4 MeV. And uh, it was also known that uh, this particular region, which is uh, less than about 130 GeV or 135 GeV, would be particularly difficult uh, at the LHC. And that was what was being pointed out by many of the supersymmetry theories, which was uh, suggesting that the mass would be less than 135 GeV. And so we did actually pay a particular attention to this. And uh, at that time, uh, be be below about 130, only the gamma-gamma mode was considered to be viable. And then the uh, ZZ star came up. And at the, so that meant particular attention to the uh, uh, tracking and to the electromagnetic calorimetry, uh, as well as the muon system. And then uh, higher up uh, in mass, uh, there were neutrino modes which come in, so missing ET was important. And also uh, booster Ws, which meant that the jets uh, which coalesce uh, would be important to recognize. Another aspect was the supersymmetry aspect that also meant that lots of bees would be produced, uh, so we had to have some bee detectors as well. So uh, that, that was something else that added into the thing. Now, in this particular plot, what you will notice is that uh, there is no WW there, there's no BB bar, there's no tau tau. So it wasn't thought that we could be actually get to those. The fact that we have been able to do that suggests that the experiments are actually more powerful than we thought. So now I just wanted to go back again to actually say that the motivation for the design of these detectors does come from the physics we want to do. And this is a, a, a one, one of the talks uh, that I, I was also responsible for, uh, which is the photon decay modes. And looking at the Higgs to gamma gamma uh, for all, all of the LHC experiments. And in the box below is indicated this uh, issue that I was mentioning, that the, uh, this would be a particularly challenging area and that the electromagnetic calorimeter had to be very performant uh, to enable us to uh, get to the Higgs to gamma gamma. And the, uh, pr the width will be obviously completely dominated by the instrumental mass resolution. And so these were the design criteria for CMS. And uh, uh, good muon uh, momentum uh, uh, measurement and identification, uh, ECAL, powerful inner tracking systems. And another one, which is the affordable detector, and we were set a limit by Chris Llewellyn Smith, who was a DG at the time, uh, for 75 million Swiss francs. So this was the design of cylindrical, classical cylindrical onion dominated by a, a solenoid, high field, high large ball uh, solenoid. And some of the problems that were associated with doing uh, physics at 10 to 34 were related to the 1 billion proton pairs that would be interacting every second. So there's large particle fluxes coming out, huge amounts of data, and very high radiation levels. So in a sense, uh, we had to actually uh, uh, innovate in many, many areas. Uh, this requirement of radiation hardness was new to us, really. And uh, uh, the motto was, if it didn't exist and we needed it, we had to invent it. So uh, just to give you a feeling for the types of questions that were being asked at the time, this is a question from Lorenzo Fo, who was our main referee at the time. 
And the question was that what happens if uh, the inner tracking doesn't work? Our tracking cavities were about 1 meter 30, so somebody was saying that tracking would not work. Of course, now we have uh, pixel detectors at 4 centimeters. So this gives you uh, an idea of the uh, uh, progress that we made from the initial discussions we were having. So this is a transverse cut of CMS, and again, the classical structure. Um, and one of the things that perhaps Abdus would have been quite proud of is that uh, uh, some of the structures that you see, the ones here and there, were produced in Pakistan. So this is a country that we went to and developed their capability. Uh, so they've been producing RPCs and perhaps now gem detectors uh, from a standing start in experimental particle physics. So that's uh, always a, an area that was satisfying that you went to countries and uh, uh, saw them grow into doing particle physics. So this is uh, uh, the same view, but uh, now I'm giving some more details. Uh, there are about, a large, about 800 uh, uh, students doing PhDs in this experiment at any one time. So these are also PhD factories apart from other types of particles. And these are the silicon detectors for the first layer, the crystals for the second layer, uh, and uh, brass plastic scintillator for the hadron calorimeters in the muon system gas chambers. Now to give you, uh, uh, so one of the things you note here is 3,000 scientists uh, from 40 countries. And again, I think, uh, again, something that Abdus, I'm sure, would have been very proud, uh, happy to see. Uh, is uh, also I picked up a quotation from him, the creation of physics is the shared heritage of all mankind, east and west, north and south, have equally participated in it. And this I think one can say about these LHC experiments, uh, people come from all over the place, and that's uh, how we've been able to achieve what we have achieved so far. Now, again, as I mentioned earlier, uh, things were not easy, it wasn't clear that these experiments would work, uh, and uh, some of the uh, uh, for example, lead tungsten crystals that we picked up in CMS. There are about three or four crystals that existed, and it's been read out, the light has been read out by silicon avalanche photodiodes, which existed in three to four research samples at the time. And we needed 75,000 crystals and 150,000 of these uh, silicon avalanche photodiodes. So a lot of work was done, actually, to uh, uh, make sure that these, uh, these detectors would be able to do the work that we wanted them to do. And this is just a, a, a cycle of uh, growth three days to grow a crystal, then you produce them into uh, objects of two by five, 400, 1700, and there's an empty space at the top, and that empty space was then filled with a huge amount of electronics, about 20, 30 centimeters, and there are all sorts of cooling things, uh, optical links, uh, low and high voltage power, and these uh, cannot be accessed, and uh, we closed these things in, 90, in uh, 2008, and we are not intending to open it until about 20, uh, uh, 22. So this is uh, essentially as if you're going to send these things to outer space. Uh, it's only been about half a percent that have been failed so far, so it's uh, very encouraging. And this is the uh, central calorimeter ready. And then I show you some other aspects of these experiments, which are the engineering aspects. So this is the central part of CMS, which is uh, ready to be lowered. And it weighs 2,000 tons, and you can see the solenoid there, uh, which is the, the main piece, uh, supporting piece of the three detectors that are going to go in there. And what you're going to see is uh, uh, the cover plate is going to retract. The crane is on the outside of the building. And uh, you can see, uh, and this is a, th a six meter uh, reinforced concrete which can take the weight. So it was just lifted a couple of centimeters above that. And it goes down, and it had to go down very straight. It took about 10 hours. This is a time lapse photography. And the clearance was uh, one hand's width on either side. So it has to be very, very straight. If there was any uh, slight tilt, uh, it would have blocked in there, and we would not have had an experiment. So this is the uh, uh, object now arriving uh, at about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, and you can see lots of people coming in. And uh, this, the whole thing was uh, actually fairly successful. And we had about 15 uh, such lifts uh, to uh, take the experiment from the surface to the underground cavern. And after about seven months of work, you had to put in all the cables and the, uh, uh, all the services, if you like. There's also cooling. Uh, fluids which uh, take the inner tracker down to minus uh, 20 degrees, which is what the case is now, in fact. And uh, again, to access any of those connections, it takes about seven or eight months of opening. So all of these things have to be pretty fidel, and they were. And this is the experiment which was uh, ready to take data, and you get an idea of the size by that uh, person walking there. And again, this is another phrase that, uh, uh, that Abdus used to use about these experiments. Uh, I think he used it uh, in the context of UA1, 
which was that these are cathedrals of science. And so that's the phrase that uh, I remember him uh, using at some point. Now let me go to the science. Uh, and so one of the first things you had to do was to figure out whether the experiment was working as you designed it. And the next thing was uh, do you produce, reproduce known physics correctly. It's only after that could you actually look for new physics. So let me just uh, give you a quick uh, few slides of this. Uh, there were hundreds and hundreds of uh, channels we looked at to understand that the performance of the detector was the one that we actually designed for. So this is just a Z um, a particle going to uh, mu pairs. And then you take uh, all of the mu pairs coming uh, in the first three or four months uh, of the high energy data taking in 2010, and you plot them, and that's the uh, uh, distribution you get. And you can see uh, about 50 years of, uh, uh, of particles discoveries uh, in one plot a uh, few months after the uh, startup. Now, to produce this plot, uh, you also had to make sure that your uh, uh, software, your analysis teams are all well trained and everything was working well, and it was actually. So this is actually quite a, a pleasing thing to have noticed. Now, what I've blown up is the Upsilon peak, because one of the criteria was that the Upsilon should have a width of about 70 MeV. That was the design cr criterion in terms of the momentum resolution. And when we looked at it, uh, the measurement gave us 64. MEV. So there are many other plots of this type, and Peter might show some as well. So <clears throat> another thing uh, that came up very fast was to uh, see uh, whether we can, were reproducing the WZ uh, top uh, and quark jet production, uh, quark gluon production, in the correct manner. So this is one of the uh, events. You can clearly see the collimated structures of the uh, gluons and the uh, quarks as such. And you plot them. Uh, so this is about uh, a couple of months after the uh, uh, first data taking at high energy started. And you can see about six or seven orders of magnitude, which we reproduce essentially out of the box. So that means that uh, also the work that had happened in, in the previous generations of uh, accelerators by, and uh, tuning by the theorists had actually produced something which uh, uh, worked out, uh, out of the box, not only in the experiment, but also theory as well. Now, this is the same sort of plot uh, which was produced uh, a few months ago uh, at the 13 TeV. And again, there's another plot here, which is the running of the uh, coupling constants. And uh, again, this now actually shows you all sorts of measurements that were made. Uh, and in green are the new measurements uh, from 13 TeV already appearing on the plot. And there's nothing inconsistent with the theoretical predictions, uh, fortunately or unfortunately. And so CMS, as well as the other experiments, are really uh, physics-producing engi engines now. And lots of publications have been uh, produced. Now let me come to uh, uh, the uh, uh, searches beyond the known physics. So the Higgs goes in there, and then uh, beyond the standard model. So I won't spend too much time on these things. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, let me look at the Higgs boson, where I'll spend a bit more time. So you have the production cross-section. There are four processes which are dominating. And the glue-glue fusion process is the dominant one. In red is the uh, uh, VBF, uh, so uh, WW fusion process, which sends jets into the forward region, which is uh, quite a powerful uh, tagger, if you like, and the WH production, TD bar H production, and so on. On the right-hand side, you have the decay modes. And clearly, BB bar is the dominant mode, but it's very difficult at the LHC because uh, BB bar production uh, from QCD is very prolific. Uh, and so one has to look at some channels which give you narrow uh, peaks like the gamma gamma or the Z, Z star. Uh, the branching fractions are quite low, uh, 2 per mil for the gamma gamma and uh, 10 to the minus 4 for, uh, uh, for leptons. So even though one would have produced 600,000 uh, Higgs bosons, uh, what ends up in the plots is about 3 to 500 in the case of the gamma gamma and the uh, order of 30 to, uh, 20 to 30 in the case of Z, Z star, which I'll show you in a few minutes. Now, it is quite helpful to have uh, about 125 GV because there are quite a few modes, actually, which are available to you, and you can actually check whether the standard model is uh, working or not. So these are the uh, uh, event displays for candidates, if you like. Uh, in one case, the signal to background is 3%. In the other case, it's one and a half. Now, this is the situation today of the uh, gamma gamma channel and the uh, four lepton channel. And uh, individually, they are above five sigma, and the peaks are very clear. Uh, and one other thing one, one wanted to show you is that this is now as the data came in. So this is when we started. And so this, this was the sort of situation at the end of 2011. Now, the red thing actually is guiding your eye. But it wasn't very clear that you'd ha you have something there. So this was the situation at the end of 2011, where uh, both experiments were seeing something in between three and four sigmas as such. 
And uh, what was done was that uh, both experiments independently decided to blind that area where that red peak is and not look at it. Uh, the blue is what the, uh, the standard model predictions are. And, uh, and then if you run the experiment a little bit longer, uh, then you get, uh, uh, sorry, uh, I should run it a little bit longer. So that was roughly the situation in July 2012 uh, when the discovery announcement was made. Now you can actually see it. And at the end of the year, uh, there's no mistaking as such. So this is how uh, evidence builds up of things if they are a bit there as such. Of course, uh, one also had to look for the Higgs into fermions as well. Uh, and as I mentioned, the BB bar channel is rather difficult. Uh, and so the effect that we saw in CMS is only two sigma. But nevertheless, the tau tau actually uh, looked to be uh, seen at uh, this evidence, in a sense, is 3.8 sigma. And you can see on the right-hand side uh, that's clearly the, uh, the Higgs goes to the, four, to the uh, fermions as well. Now, Peter is going to show some uh, data which, uh, where the two experiments have combined uh, the data on the Higgs. And uh, there you'll see clearly things which are uh, seen at uh, five sigma level. Now, this one, one of the things I also wanted to point out is uh, you can actually look at the signal strength. So combine all the data. Peter will say more about it. And uh, the combined measurement gives you 1.09. So this is the ratio of what uh, uh, you, we measure and what standard model would have predicted. Um, ideal case, it'll be one with very small error. But the error is about an order of uh, 11%. But one other thing to note is that uh, the theoretical errors are not small. They're about 7 or 8%. So there is also work needed there as we move, move forward. And one way to actually overcome these things is to actually go to the ratios as such. So on the top part, you have the production mechanism ratios. And the bottom, you have the branching fraction ratios. And some of the uh, theoretical errors cancel in that, uh, and, uh, and some of the systematics. And that makes a, a better probe of what's going on. So this is uh, data from the publication. Uh, uh, we're preparing a publication. These are results that were produced in the summer, combining the two experiments. Now, one of the things uh, we now have to look forward to is to look forward. And so the question really comes up is, uh, should one really expect new physics? We had some discussion yesterday about this. Uh, and uh, there's also, I think, was said that there is observational evidence, uh, which is related to uh, neutrinos uh, uh, having mass and oscillating. There is this issue of the lightness of the Higgs boson. There's also uh, evidence for dark matter, and as was mentioned, uh, also the uh, matter-antimatter asymmetry. So there is evidence that uh, there is a physics beyond the standard model. The problem <coughs> we have is that uh, previously, uh, so far, we've always had a, a nearby physics scale which was set by something, uh, like the WL, WL scattering in the case of neutrino electrons or the Higgs at uh, the level of 1 TeV. And as you go forward, uh, this guidance is not really there. It's there, at, uh, and this, but the scale could be anything. And so we're left with looking at things which are the ones that we found, for example, the Higgs, and looking at the precision work and seeing if there are deviations from that, and, uh, and then also looking for new physics directly. Uh, now, this is the issue of the lightness of the Higgs uh, boson, where the uh, loop corrections are coming in. I mean, these loop corrections are the same uh, feature as, uh, for example, that uh, was shown uh, yesterday in terms of working out what the mass of the top quark was or the mass of the Higgs boson. So uh, unless there's something happening, th th we have to take some uh, 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 note of this. And that leads to this uh, aspect of supersymmetry, which, uh, uh, which cancels these uh, uh, loops uh, and makes the thing uh, uh, low in mass. But it has this spectrum. Uh, and uh, can be very many different ways, uh, many different spectra, because supersymmetry is rather uh, an object that's difficult to get hands on. And so this is one spectrum, which is still allowed, which shows, uh, which actually uh, pulls down the uh, third generation quarks down to the level of about 500 GeV. And that actually is the sort of favored mechanism if you wanted to have a, a, a naturalist argument for solving the previous problem I mentioned. Now. The searches at LHC, I won't go into the details of it because there are hundreds of them. Uh, they're split by the production process and also by the final state characteristics. And this is shown here in terms of the, uh, uh, the strong production, which is high cross-section, which is uh, gluinos and uh, quarks, quarks as such. And then the third generation production, which I just alluded to, and the electroweak production, which is rather low in cross-section, difficult. And then you have the R parity conserving, and violating, and long-lived uh, uh, particles as such. And so you, you look for searches where you have uh, several high PT jets, uh, large missing ET, 
and uh, charged leptons. And so one candidate event is on the right-hand side, clearly imbalanced, but that can come from a Z as well, obviously. Now, one has a notion of summarizing these things in these very complicated uh, ways. But I think there's a, in, in this mess, you'll see a, 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 a thing which I'm now going to point out, which says the branching fraction is equal to 100%. So clearly, this is not really very uh, natural to think about. But that's the only, one, only way we can actually present the data. So this has to be taken with great caution uh, in, in interpreting uh, such plots as such. Now, another way that we present these plots in these is uh, these lines as such. Now, each one of these lines is an analysis, which has about 30 to 40 people working on it. And they have to work out all of the backgrounds, all of the uh, signal uh, Monte from the Monte Carlos. And most of the backgrounds are worked out from the data themselves. And uh, you have to work out the systematics, the uh, statistical errors, and all sorts of things. And also then uh, uh, get it reviewed as such before the results are, are made public. So there's a long process. Uh, in each of these lines and ends up uh, looking like a paper. And so on the right hand, on the left hand side are the types of searches. And again, um, we haven't found anything, so uh, this, this remains as the sort of uh, uh, limits, but limits have to be interpreted with the previous cautionary statement that I made. Now, the other things that, uh, so that was supersymmetry, but clearly we're looking for all sorts of other things like uh, heavy uh, resonances, uh, uh, new gauge bosons, uh, leptoquarks, excited fermions, black holes, dark matter, and, and many, many more things. And this is one where uh, you look for the Z prime, and you can see that uh, there are the data on the left-hand side from the 7 and 8 TeV, and on the right-hand side, the 13 TeV. So that is starting to get sensitive uh, because the mass is high, and the higher energy actually does help a lot uh, in this particular case. And so again, you can end up with the uh, charts like this, where uh, we haven't found anything. You can see uh, limits, which I go from a half a TeV to a few TeV as such. And uh, so this is the sort of work uh, which will now extend. And uh, one other point that I should make is that uh, now you've seen these two uh, plots, and there are hundreds of channels, and there are uh, probably thousands of plots that we look at. And if, so it is not a surprise that you sometimes see two, three sigma uh, deviations as such. So I'm going to show you a few things, and you have to bear that in mind, that these are you know, things which happen and should happen uh, and through statistical fluctuations. And, uh, and I, I, that's why I indicated to you when I was running the plot for the uh, ZZ star that you know, 2011 uh, could have been anything. So let's have a look at the outlook. The outlook uh, suggests that uh, we've just started uh, taking data at the LHC, and it's going to continue for about uh, another 15, 20 years. And the, on the blue line is the accumulated luminosity that we expect. So we expect some like 300 inverse femtobarns by 2023. And uh, this year we expect about 30 <coughs> compared to the four that we've taken so far. <coughs> and going, going up to about 3,000. So that's the scheme. And this actually gives you some idea of the increased reach uh, as far as uh, last year's run was concerned. So you have to get to high mass objects uh, to see an improvement in the limits, uh, in the masses at the level of a couple of TeV. So I'm just going to show you a few plots. And there are about 30 channels that were presented uh, by CMS and a similar number by Atlas uh, in December. So these are searches that we make. And they are, they are essentially uh, wired in when we, before we start taking data. They're all prepared. And then you produce the results. And sometimes you see a fluctuation, sometimes you don't. Uh, and some of the fluctuations of the previous runs have disappeared this year, uh, last year rather. So I think all of this has to be taken with caution. So when I show you some things, again, uh, we tend to be very prudent and not make any claims uh, on uh, things uh, which are not uh, really certified. In addition, we know that we're going to take 10 times more data this year. So there's no hurry to do anything. But nevertheless, uh, all of these plots are made public because there are 30 analyses, 30 notes which are public. So you see these. Uh, uh, the warts and all in them, they have all been scrutinized inside the experiments uh, and uh, re um, uh, ready for publication. So this is the, for example, digests, look for uh, searches in digests to look for resonances and compositeness and all sorts of things. And I won't go into that. It just sh shows you the scales and the results which are uh, indicating the uh, uh, such resonances have to have very high masses if they exist. And then this comes, this is the diphoton resonance, which has uh, been causing some uh, excitement. And this is a typical event display at uh, 7, 745 GeV. And this was also shown by Kaiser yesterday. And that's the sort of peak. Now, on the right-hand side, you see a, a p-value plot, which is a plot 
uh, which indicates in the absence of any signal, what is the probability that a pure background would fluctuate to one, two, three sigma level. And so that's what that plot is showing. And also what you notice there are the 0.5 sigma peaks, one sigma peaks, there are two sigma peaks, there are three sigma dips rather, not peaks. Uh, and so this is what you'd expect uh, in a normal distribution. And uh, in a sense, uh, the only reason perhaps there is a, a bit of excitement is that uh, Atlas also sees that in a rather similar place. Uh, and, uh, but you can also see the plot that I just shown you, which is actually rather more squeezed than the Atlas one, which Peter will talk about a bit more. And as I said, you know, uh, we have a factor of 10 more data coming up, so we shall see. Okay, so let me now go to the uh, expectations for phase one. So clearly we found a new object and uh, it behoves us to actually study it well. And uh, every time we find a new object, it takes about 10 years to understand what it is exactly. And so this is the work that is going to be going on. And with 300 inverse uh, uh, femto bounds, we'll get about 10 million Higgs, which are produced. Uh, so there are channels which, uh, and these are the sort of uh, precisions that we'll be getting. These are predictions of the precisions, and we've found that we do better than these predictions on the whole. And clearly, one will be searching for new things. Uh, maybe uh, I just showed you one of the uh, a few types of uh, analysis that we use, actually, to look for new things. There are hundreds of analyses which are ongoing all the time. And so also, one shouldn't forget that uh, because these are WZ top factories as well. So if there are any deviations in their properties, uh, then we should actually also see them. And that might give us the clue as to what's happening beyond the standard model. <coughs> one of the things which I also wanted to show to you is that uh, this is a, a transparency that uh, I think it was one of the first talks about going to 10 to 35. Uh, luminosity, and this was uh, shown uh, in, in January tw 20, uh, two, 2001, so 15 years ago. So this is the front page uh, of this transparency, which I, uh, the talk that I gave at a, a faculty meeting. And so this was uh, looking at the challenges, and some of these challenges now have to be undertaken. Uh, and also, uh, I once wanted to point out that look at the time scales and they were obviously not terribly realistic. So whenever you do things, they take a long time. Uh, to do them uh, because they're difficult. So now one can look even further ahead and see uh, what would one would get with 3,000 uh, inverse femtobounds. And here the precisions uh, go to uh, the level of uh, 2 to 10 percent. Uh, these are individual precisions. And the, in, the, in here, one has actually assumed that the theory errors that I was mentioning earlier would be halved as such. Now, if they can be uh, better than that, then the precision will be somewhat better than this because we are not actually starting to get limited by statistical errors, but by uh, theoretical errors, and the ratios might help. So, but nevertheless, the, the other thing to remember is that when you're looking for a, an effect, I think Carla mentioned that, if you're looking for an effect of one uh, five sigma effect at the level of half a percent, uh, you know, it's, or one percent, it's very tough, because you have to make a, a measurement which is uh, better than that. So that, uh, bearing that in mind, uh, now going to the uh, last but one slide is the, the issue of the upgrades as such. Now, the detectors were designed for 500 inverse femtobands, not the 300 that we expected, so they were designed to do 50% more. But they're not designed to do 10 times more. And there are certain areas of the detector which will need changing. Uh, and the, the inner tracker, in the case of both uh, experiments, and in the case of CMS, uh, the end cap calorimeters have to be changed because we had a plastic scintillator end cap calorimeter as well, a uh, hadron part. Now, the technologies we'll be using to replace them, I think, will be more performant than what we have today, uh, in so much as so that the physics quality will improve. And one place where it definitely will in improve is in the trigger DAQ system, uh, because at the moment, uh, we were only able to take, uh, thank you, we're only able to take a, a small amount of uh, data out to make the trigger decision because the links uh, and the networks at that time were not powerful enough. Now they are powerful enough. So the idea attempt now is to take essentially a lot, lot of the event uh, as far as the calorimeters are concerned and the muon system is concerned to the outside and make the trigger decision with uh, fine-grained information in very much more powerful processes as such. Not custom design anymore, but uh, ASICs, so, uh, not ASICs, sorry, FPGAs, uh, which you buy from industry as such. So you're actually bringing the, uh, uh, the processing farm into the level one. 
And that is needed because uh, as we increase the luminosity, the pileup goes up and the uh, event quality degrades. Yet we want to study the Higgs boson. The Higgs boson itself has a mass which is quite low. It's about 125 GeV. So the particles that are coming from it have low PTs, uh, comparatively speaking. So if you want to actually trigger on these, you must be able to trigger on the products. And that makes uh, it's very difficult in high luminosity environment as such, uh, 10 to the 35 or 5, 10 to the 34. So one of the, the ways of dealing with this is actually to increase the bandwidth. So instead of 100 kilohertz, which we uh, pass on to a, a processing farm, we'll pass on 750 kilohertz or a, a megahertz. So that's one way. The second is, as I mentioned earlier, to uh, pull out a lot more detailed information. And the third one, which is a uh, novel, uh, is to bring the uh, central tracking into the trigger system as such. And uh, so those are the sort of things. And in the case of the NCAP calorimeter, we're thinking in CMS of a, a very powerful calorimeter, which gives you not only the X, Y, Z, the energy, but also the time information in a very, very fine grain, uh, order of uh, every uh, half a radiation length and every centimeter square or half centimeter square. So this will make actually the recognition of things like the VBF jets very interesting and powerful, allowing us to trigger on these things without putting a condition in the central region so that we actually can see what's going on. And all you need is actually the WW fusion process. And whatever comes out of it, uh, we should be able to trigger. So let me come to the last transparency, the summary. I think the construction of the standard model is a towering intellectual uh, achievement of humankind. And Abdul Salam was, I think, in the first rank amongst its constructors. And that also means the theoreticians and also the experimentalists as such. So it's a huge amount of work in the last 50 years. Now, after 25 years of design, construction, and first exploitation, we're in the second half of this journey, uh, that of the exploitation of the full scientific potential. And there are several new techn technologies which were developed, and others were pushed to their limits to do this. Uh, massive discovery has been made, and there's no evidence yet for the uh, beyond the standard model Higgs. And uh, so I think the discovery is just the start of the exploration of this uh, Terra scale. And I think AHEAD is a, quite an exciting program of physics, but also innovation in terms of the uh, detectors that we'll need to upgrade for the next phase. And uh, the question we're all asking is, will new physics show up in this run? And uh, clearly, uh, hopefully, by the end of this year, we'll start getting some clues to this. And I think finally, as you all know, uh, only the experiments and, uh, can actually reveal and confirm nature's secrets. Uh, so let me stop here and thank you for your attention.